So the number one vital element needed for life is oxygen and that, that's not a surprise, is it? The second most vital element needed for life is water. You can go three minutes without oxygen. You can go a couple of weeks without water. I always thought it was three days without water until I read, uh, I read a book called The Long Walk about some people who were escaping the Siberian work camp and they were in the desert and they went nearly two weeks without water. Water is the second most vital element needed for life. In fact, where there's no water, you don't usually get people living, do you? I always say to people, how much water do you drink? And these are some of the answers. Uh, I don't like water. Um, if I drink water, my feet swell. If I drink water, I'm going to the bathroom all day. Those last two answers tell me that the water's not getting inside the cell. So how do we get the water inside the cell? We have to go to the third most vital element needed for life, and that is sodium. The fourth most vital element needed for life is potassium. In nature, we find the highest amount of sodium in seawater, and seawater contains 92 minerals. Of those 92 minerals, 30%, approximately 30% is sodium, and of those 92 minerals, approximately 50% is chloride. Now because sodium chloride take up the most amount, they're the first crystals formed when the water is evaporated. So what man does is he scoops up the first crystals formed, he bleaches them white, puts aluminium with it so that it runs freely, and there's your table salt. Table salt is a dangerous salt because we now have two very harsh minerals that if you were in to inject both of those into the blood you would die. There's two harsh minerals and they need all the other 90 to soften them and balance them. The highest concentration of mineral inside the cell is potassium. The highest concentration outside the cell is sodium. And in this bilayered membrane that is around every cell, there are sodium potassium pumps. And these sodium potassium pumps are ever going like this, maintaining the balance between potassium and sodium. But when someone's not eating enough fruits and vegetables, and that's where you get most of your potassium, and they're putting table salt on everything far too much, what happens now is sodium levels rise and potassium levels drop. There is a small amount of sodium in the cell, but when this happens, you see osmosis and diffusion happens when the highest concentration merges into the lowest. So now sodium levels inside the cell are rising, which they should not, and the cell swells. What's that called? High blood pressure. The doctor is right. Table salt will, will contribute to high blood pressure. There's a French doctor named Dr. Lelangri, and he's written a whole book on salt. He said, when people come to me with high blood pressure, I put them on Celtic salt. Why does he put them on Celtic salt? Because Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. It's a hand harvested sea salt. What about Himalayan salt? In many places, Himal Himalayan salt is a lot easy to get. There's 70, about 75 minerals. So it's pretty good, but I prefer the Celtic salt. And one reason is that the Celtic salt has three magnesiums. It contains magnesium chloride and magne magnesium bromide and magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is a water hungry molecule. And this explains why the Celtic salt is such a moist salt, especially when we've had a lot of rain, because those three magnesiums absorb the moisture. And because Magnesium is a water-hungry molecule. It can be used to help the water get into the cell. So when you take a crystal of Celtic salt, put it on your tongue, and some say, how big's a crystal? Well, if you've got high blood pressure, start small, about the size of a sesame seed. I don't have high blood pressure, so I might have about three times little sesame seeds. Put it on your tongue, your mucous membranes start absorbing the minerals, the magnesium is taken to the cell membrane and you drink your water and that magnesium pulls that water inside the cell. It's the quickest way to hydrate a body. The only time excess water drinking can be dangerous is if people drink too much at once and don't have the 
minerals that are in the Celtic salt to pull that water inside the cell. I've had people complain to me, they say, I'm drinking more water now and now I'm going to the bathroom all day. So I say, are you, are you having the salt? Have a little crystal be before every glass of water. And ideally we should be having approximately eight glasses of water a day. And then I say to them, and don't drink a whole glass at once. <laughs> I think I mentioned earlier, I drink half a glass as soon as I get up. I go to the bathroom, I drink another half glass. Then I get dressed and have another half glass. But when I start every glass, I have that little bit of salt. So you spread the water over the day. And many people have said to me, thank you so much. That, that has made a big difference. See, huge water in, it's not long before huge water has to come out. It's like watering a plant. And look how God sends the rain, little by little by little. And when there's a tornado, when there's a torrential downpour, that's when the soil gets washed away and, and flooding can happen. So remember that with your body. Take it little by little by little by little. It is the best way to take it. Did you know that sodium chloride is so strong it can kill the taste buds? Have you seen people that eat table salt? They put it on everything and they put it on before they've even tasted it. Well, no wonder their taste buds are dying. Whereas Celtic salt, with all of its minerals, it, it enhances the flavour of the food. Now, the red lentils we had this morning, a few people have said, what's in this? I've even served it at my house at breakfast and people have said, is there chicken in this? And I know why they say that. It's because it's so flavoursome. Well, it has a little olive oil, some, some herbs, nice if you can get fresh, or Italian herbs, and some Celtic salt and a bit of turmeric. That's it. I rinse it very well. It must be rinsed well first. And I do that just before it's fully cooked. And yet, as you can see, it's delicious. See, I'm not interested in cooking up onions and garlic and much as I love that in my lentils, I'll do that at lunchtime. But in the morning, I've got hills to run up and down, creeks to jump in. I'm not interested in, in being in the kitchen for a long time. And that's a very quick dish to, to make. So sodium not only is required to get the glucose into the blood, it's also required to get the water into the cell. So it's sodium. It's the third most vital element needed for life. And you can get that information on the four vitals in any anatomy and physiology book, chemistry book, biology book. I'm just giving you the facts here. So as you can see, water is very important, but so is the salt. And again, the potassium is found in all your fresh fruits and vegetables. Calcium cannot get into the cell by itself. It needs vitamin D. When vitamin D is present, the calcium is pulled inside the cell. If you just imagine for a moment, and this is happening in America a lot today, people are not drinking enough water, they're not having the whole salt, and they're definitely not having many greens, which is where your magnesium is. So the little bit of water they're having is not getting inside the cell. They don't go out in the sunshine because they're scared of getting skin cancer. So they're not getting their vitamin D, so the calcium can't get in and the minerals can't get in. And they're trying to lose weight, so they've listened to a lot of the media hype that you've got to stop the fat because fat will make you fat. So they're on a high carbohydrate diet. Remember what fat will do? It'll give you satisfaction or a satiation, a full feeling. But if you're not having any fat, you just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. The whole packet of cookies goes, the whole chips go. There's almost, there's not a sign in your body that says enough. It's the fiber, protein, and the good fats that will give you that sign. So they're on a high carbohydrate diet, thinking that if they go fat free, they'll lose weight. And can you see what's happening? The water can't get in, the minerals can't get in, the glucose can't get in, and the body says, what are we going to do? Because remember, this is the CBD of the human body. What are we going to do? And the body says, we've got one last thing up our sleeve. We'll just force it into the cell. That's high blood pressure. 
So high blood pressure can be a result of dehydration. It can be a result of mineral deficiency, magnesium deficiency. It can be a result of vitamin D deficiency. It can be a result of a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet. It can be a result of inactivity. So there's a whole lot of things that can come together to contribute to. I'd like to take you inside and look at a few body functions and how they're affected by dehydration. So let's begin at the mouth. Did you know that in a state of chronic dehydration, too much saliva is produced? Some people think a dry mouth is a sign of de dehydration. It is, and too much saliva can be a sign of dehydration. You see, when not, what an, not enough water is going into the body, and how much water should go in? Let's do an assessment of that. So our kidneys, to know how much water should go in, we need to look at how much is coming out. So our, in our kidneys, we urinate out 1.5 litre loss. Now, a litre is the same as a quart. So I'm probably best, because I'm speaking to an American audience, to say quart loss, 1.5 quart loss. Out of the skin, it can be 0.5 of a quart loss. Out of the colon, 0.3 of a quart loss. And out of the lungs, it's about a 0.2 of a quart loss. So that, that equals uh, two and a half quart loss every day. So two quarts is eight cups. So that's uh, 10 glasses, eight ounce glasses of water a day is lost out of the body. And we have no reserve tank on the back, do we? The only water that's going in is the water we take in. So we should be drinking at least two quarts a day, at least more if possible. Now at the moment, because you're having a steam sauna every day, I wouldn't be surprised if you've got a 0.8 of a quart loss coming out of your skin because you perspire it profusely. The other half can come in your fruits and your vegetables, maybe your herb teas, uh, vegetable juice through the day. So that's how much water we need. And Dr. Batman Geheldi, he showed that the first place that we feel that water loss, if we're not replacing the water, the body goes into a form of drought management and it releases a hormone to manage this drought management. It's called histamine. And if someone has an allergic response to something, what are they given? Antihistamine. You know the best antihistamine is just water. So the first place that water is taken from to try and maintain full blood volume in the in the veins and arteries is the lining of the stomach. We have a thick mucosal wall lining the stomach, and so now we've got a very thin mucosal wall. Now in that mucosal wall, there's sodium bicarbonate, and the sodium bicarbonate is in the mucosa wall to neutralize any stomach acid that might try and get through and basically protect against, uh, against uh, stomach ulcers. So what is a stomach ulcer? It's basically a breakdown. Of when we smell food and we start to chew food, hydrochloric acid, here's hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid is released. And hydrochloric acid connects with pepsinogen to release pepsin, which breaks down protein, but hydrochloric acid does something else. It's antifungal, antibacterial, and so it has the ability to wipe out these guys. And just as hydraulic acid is considering going down and wiping these guys out, he has a big glass of water. And what does water do to hydrochloric acid? It just dilutes it. So Helicobacter pylori is chomping away at the dead tissue and it goes, whew, that was close, chomp, chomp. When someone comes to me with Helicobacter pylori, one of the first things I do is increase their hydrochloric acid. Because if you increase the hydrochloric acid, remember what one of its roles is? Antibacterial, anti-yeast, antifungal. Now I'm not criticizing the doctors that discovered that Helicobacter pylori causes stomach ulcer. It is there, it does play a role, but why is it there? Can you see that? And unfortunately, on the board that awards Nobel Prizes, there are representatives from the pharmaceutical companies. So we won't go any further there, and I certainly am not saying people that get Nobel 
prizes don't deserve it. Absolutely they do because of their, their, their great work. But I'm just presenting you the facts. I'm just giving you the basic anatomy and physiology. Dr. Batman Geheldhind, he, we call him Dr. B. He found the first place that we lose water is the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. He also found that if you go down the gastrointestinal tract, you come to the pancreas. And the pancreas releases two hormones into the blood to help balance blood sugar levels. That's your insulin and your glucagon. But if you're dehydrated, those hormones aren't being made as they should be. So people that are dehydrated, that can be a contributing factor to diabetes. He also discovered that there are hormones released from the pancreas to finalize digestion. So there's pancreatic lipase to finalize starch digestion. Sorry, fat digestion. There's pancreatic Amylase, that's what finalizes starch digestion. There's trypsin and chymotrypsin that finalize protein digestion. Now they're all made out of water. If you don't have enough water, your, your digestion will be compromised. At every stage, water is needed for every body function. So no wonder Dr. Beat entitled his, bo his book when a person has a symptom of disease, he says, must be one of the body's many cries for water. That's the title of his book. Our brain cells shrink when they don't have enough water. Headaches are common when we don't have enough water. Negative thought patterns can develop when our brain cells don't have enough water. I can get my hand to go in and out like that without pain because around every joint there's fluid. And that fluid is synovial fluid and it is 99% water. In a state of dehydration, the body can take some water from there to maintain full blood volume in the major arteries and veins. And so if I have pain in there, maybe it's called arthritis, but actually maybe it's just a state of dehydration. Our eyeball moves around in water. So we need water at every single step. Also our lungs. Now at the bottom of our lungs, I'll draw you a small picture of our lungs so that you'll understand this. So here's our, here's our lungs here. That's one lung. So your tra trachea splits and comes down mm. and then it splits again into little bronchioles. It's quite a process. And then at the end of every bronchial, there's looks like a little bunch of grapes, but they're alveoli. So at the end of the bronchioles, you've got the alveoli. And this is where the gaseous exchange takes place. Over every alveoli, there's a little blood capillary network. And it is in that blood capillary network where the oxygen is picked up from the alveoli and the blood drops the carbon dioxide and we breathe out. In every alveoli, there's a minuscule droplet of water. And because of the surface tension of water, when you breathe out, that little alveoli collapses, which allows all the carbon dioxide, the majority of it, to be breathed out. So that now when you breathe in, you can breathe in more oxygen. In a state of dehydration, that little droplet of water is not as it should be, which means that doesn't totally collapse when you breathe out, which means you can't get your full quota of oxygen. But what also happens, the body, to prevent the water loss, it can start constricting the, uh, alve the, the, um, the little bronchioles so that we don't lose water. And so one of the signs of dehydration can be constricted, constricted breathing. The blood gets very thick in dehydration. Our blood needs to be nice and thin so the heart can pump it easily, so that the little filtering units in our kidneys can, can filter it with ease. So water is needed for every single body function. I'm going to